Enchanté. You are listening to the What The Fab podcast, where empowered women empower women through candid conversations, inspiring stories, and tangible tips. I'm your host, Elise Armitage. I'm a digital creator, and I left my nine to five job at Google to chase my dreams of being an entrepreneur. I'm so happy to have you here. Let's get into some real talk. Hello, and welcome back to the What the Fab podcast. Thanks so much for joining today. I can hardly believe that we are already on episode number eight. I've been having so much fun recording all of these episodes, both the solo ones and the interviews. And a big thank you to everybody that has reached out to me, DM'd me, emailed me, left reviews, and shared feedback and also ideas and requests for topics in the future. If you haven't taken a second yet to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you listen to, that would be amazing. Amazing if you could do that because it's the best way to support this podcast and help it grow. Today, we have an incredible guest coming on the show to speak with us about everything you need to know about the COVID vaccine, Dr. Jenny Ting. Dr. Ting is a distinguished professor of genetics at UNC Chapel Hill. She is the president of the American Association of Immunology, where she just recently virtually hosted Dr. Anthony Fauci, where he shared updates on COVID and the vaccine. To the world, she is Dr. Ting, a world-class expert in all things immunology and microbiology biology, but to me, she is my Aunt Jenny. In this conversation, we discuss how the vaccine works, how RNA is being used for the first time in this vaccine, and why it's safe. We get into side effects that you should be aware of, if pregnant women and children can get the vaccine, her predictions on when young, healthy people will get access to the vaccine, and other factors that that is dependent on, and so much more. I learned a ton from this conversation, and I think you will too, so be sure to share this episode with your loved ones, your family, and friends so that they can be aware too, because knowledge is power. With that, let's welcome Dr. Jenny Ting to the show to talk about the COVID vaccine. Hello, Dr. Ting. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you very much, Elise, for inviting me. Thank you so much. It's kind of making me giggle calling you Dr. Ting because I'm used to calling you Aunt Jenny, but you have an incredible background and that is recognized in your title. And I'm just so excited to have you on the podcast and to chat with you about the COVID vaccine today. I'm very glad about the invitation. Thank you. So before we dive in, I'm just going to give a quick reminder for listeners that this is obviously not personalized medical advice. This is just Dr. Ting graciously sharing her knowledge with us about the current state of the vaccine and current research around it. But as we all know, the landscape is constantly shifting. Um, So let's go ahead and dive in. I thought it would be good to just do a quick overview of the logistics around the vaccine, just so everyone's on the same page. So you need two rounds or, or doses. How many days apart are they? And then how long long after that second shot does it take for you to have immunity? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm also glad you brought up the point that this is not personalized medical advice. It's just general information uh, given as an immunologist. Uh, so the logistics is you get the first shot, then you wait, depending on which vaccine it is, it's usually between three and four weeks. So when you go get your shots, they will tell you, so not to confuse people, you know, they will tell you this is this vaccine, come back in three weeks or four weeks. So that's generally the time frame you go back. There's a little bit of give on both sides, so you can maybe get it a little bit earlier or you can get it a few weeks later. So it's not like if you don't make it right on that day, you don't have any immunity. That's not like that at all. So there's quite a bit of give. And I know you have a second part to the question. The second part was um, how how long does it take after that second shot for you to have immunity? Yeah. So it takes about probably a couple weeks to give you pretty good immunity. So the whole idea of two doses, is one dose give, gives you some immunity, but not enough. And the second dose really kicks it in. And the two vaccines are really impressive, the ones that are on the market. So they're in the 90th percentile rank, which is huge. Wow. Um, Yeah, so when we 
think about flu is anywhere from 30 to 70. A good year is 70% protection. But these two are really, really good. So that's why the protection, you know, people are really encouraged by it. But we can talk some more about, you know, how it's a new platform and stuff. But yeah, yeah. The efficiency is very high. Wow. Okay. So you've already answered my second question, which was uh, what kind of immunity you're seeing after receiving both of the doses. So it's it's pretty high. You said it's about 90%. Yeah. Depending on the, so in the early days when the data were coming out, for the Pfizer vaccine, they said it's like 90 something. And then Moderna came out and said it was 95. And Pfizer actually went back and said, we're actually 95 too. So I think they're really equivalent okay. because they're very similar. And um, so there are lots of other questions that we can answer as we go through. But on the surface, it looks as good as any vaccine. Wow. And have they determined yet if you can still spread the virus, even though you personally are vaccinated and protected from it? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. So that is a concern. Uh, there's some data suggesting that the vaccine is great at clearing your lung and stuff, you know, taking care of any viruses that go into the lung, but it's not as good as taking care of your nasal, which is in your nose, virus. So if you have some viruses in your nose, you're going to spread it to other people if you just sneeze. So even after you get the vaccine, you have to still be cautious about spreading it, right? Yes. So you know, wear a mask. I suspect we'll be wearing masks for a little bit longer than we hope. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, that's good to know that we should still anticipate wearing a mask afterwards and, and being careful just to make sure that others around us are protected. Um, okay. This might get a little bit over my head, but I'm going to ask the question anyways. How does this particular vaccine work? Because it's the first time that RNA has been approved for vaccination. So what does that mean and what does it do in the body to help lend protection? Yeah, you've done your homework. So this is the first time in the history of mankind that we're using RNA. So what is it? So everybody knows gene, right? You said you would say it's in my DNA, right? Meaning that's genetics, right? We inherited that. So DNA has to be made into a protein, and the protein is what causes your immunity. But in the intermediate between the DNA and protein is the so-called messenger RNA. So it's RNA. So in between the two, there is this step that requires RNA, and then RNA makes the protein. So we have never really used RNA in vaccines because there are some problems with it because it's very fragile. That's why you have to keep it at minus 80. So it's like breaks down all the time. So that's why the shipping is so difficult. You have to put it in minus 80, but it's really, really fast. So that's why they ramp up this vaccine like there's no tomorrow. It's because they went, they skip um, some harder step and just went to the RNA. So the uh, when you think about the three, I often think about you know, it's like if you have somebody who can speak French to the second person and the second person is bilingual. So the second person can speak, let's say, Spanish. So he can translate the French to the Spaniard, mm -hmm. right? The middle guy is your messenger RNA, right? We used to always use the Spaniard to do stuff. You know, we use the protein to cause immunity. But now they said, why don't we go one step above to the, this bilingual guy so he can make the protein for us. And that's exactly what it's like. So uh -huh. he skipped a major step. So the proteins are really hard to make. You know, you have to like have lots of cells growing. You have to have like all these things going on. It's pretty expensive and the RNA is much easier to make. So that's why this is the first time, but it's not really the first time it's done in the laboratory. People have been studying this for decades, mm. like how to improve instead of having to do protein, what else can you do, right? So if this is the first time we put it in people, but these RNAs have been used in treating like 
animals and and not not for a vaccine, but like in the laboratory. So that has been done for a long time and they have safety data, et cetera. So that's where you go. And so once you have a pro, so the RNA goes into your body, then it uses your body like a factory and makes the protein. But the RNA, once it goes into your body, remember I told you RNA is very, really fragile. It mm-hmm. goes in and gets chewed up. So it's done. So it makes the protein and the protein stays around and immun- pretty much immunizes your body. So your body's like, wait, I've never seen this protein before. This is something foreign. I got to take it out. And that's basically immunity is they, they want to take this protein out. And so anything that has this protein it wants to take it out. So the virus has this protein. So then your body will generate an immune system, chase after the virus with this protein. So that's how it works. Wow. Thank you. I You explained it so well that I could easily follow. And I loved the <laughs> analogy of the, the bilingual translator. Um, I have to give a shout out to Hannah here. So for listeners, Hannah is uh, my sister and she is a science writer at Stanford Medical. And she helped me craft that question about the <laughs> RNA. So I have to give props where they're due oh, for that. Wow, one. this is so impressive. <laughs> <laughs> it is even impressive even asking Hannah. You know? <laughs> well, she helped she helped me with some of my research beforehand because I was like, you know, she writes about this all day long for her day yeah. job. So That's okay, good. so once you get the first dose, what are the logistics around the timing for the second dose and getting that in a timely matter? Like, are you guaranteed to be able to have access to that? Because I was just reading an article in Science Magazine about how there could be a potential problem with extending the dosing interval past that kind of three to four week range because it could result in millions of people with only partial immunity as they wait for that second dose. And that could potentially create a breeding ground for vaccine resistant mutations. But then on the other hand, there's the argument that having twice as many people with partial immunity could be better than full immunity in only half of half of them. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I don't think having one dose is worse than having no dose. It's pretty clear they've shown if you have one dose, you may be protected 50%. Okay. You know, so you have some protection. You know, hopefully there'll there will be enough dosage for the second dose. That's the whole plan. Um, so I you know, I hope the government would do a good job of making sure there are gonna be two dosage, which is the proper way to do it. I don't think having the first dose would create a breeding ground for mutants because as long as people still wear masks, you know, that's Mm -hmm. the major theme. If everybody takes one dose and they throw away their mask, they're going to infect each other and some people are going to get sick and so forth. So still the old fashioned way of wearing masks and then you may have, you know, the one dose, you will be more protected than somebody who's never had the vaccine. But the ideal thing is to have two doses, two yeah. doses. Okay, that's really good to know. And so you mentioned Moderna and Pfizer. Are there any others or is it just those two? There's a ton. Oh. So but you've heard of Sputnik, right? The Russian uh-huh. one. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure I would take that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> When I look at it, I'm like, no, there's not much transparency. Yeah. Um, so you worry about, you know, work that has no transparency. All the ones that's used by here, the, the data is published. So everybody can go and look mm-hmm. at it. They're peer reviewed, meaning people criticized it, looked through it, made sure there's no holes. So there is some credibility uh, with that kind of publication. You know, China has many uh, that are being done. So any of those, uh, and one of the things they're trying to do, of course, is to go to poor countries and give it to them, you know, for whatever reason. Um, But the ones that here that we have, I feel like it's pretty well studied. 
This episode is brought to you by Flowdesk. Flowdesk is an incredible email marketing service provider, and they are the platform that I use for my email campaigns for What the Fab. The platform is so intuitive and easy to use. It's very drag and drop. And best of all, it's aesthetic AF. The templates are beautiful, and you can easily add your own brand colors to it to make sure that your emails look and feel like you. I used to use MailChimp back in the day, but after trying Flowdesk out about a year ago, I was in love and I know you will be too. You can give Flowdesk a try for 30 days free. And if you want to keep them, which I know you will, you can use my referral link to lock in a 50% off price at $19 a month and lock that in forever. You can get this offer and try it for free at whatthefab.com slash Flowdesk. And that is spelled F-L-O-D-E-S-K. That's whatthefab.com slash flowdesk. I can't wait to see what stunning emails you create. Okay, let's get back to the episode. Well, I was going to ask you if those two vaccines, Moderna and Pfizer, if they're identical and equally effective. Yes. Yeah, so those two turn out to be remarkably similar. Uh, They're similar in their design, and they're similar in their requirement. They're similar in what they... It, uh, you know, in the body, what kind of immunity it uh, causes. There are other vaccines, too, that are still being tested. So one is J&J. So Janssen is coming up with, a, uh, I think it's the adenovirus. So they put another virus that's pretty mild. It doesn't, you know, we all, most of us have it. They put the protein I was telling you about, the spike protein, that came from mRNA and the other vaccines. Instead, they put that gene into this virus. So the virus is going to make the protein. Hmm. So that's one form. There's a Glaxo, GSK, Sanofi, and they're basically doing the old-fashioned way, which they're going to go through the protein and then putting it with something that helps the protein to get an immunity. And of course, you can see the time difference, right? Here, these RNA vaccines are already out. So there's a big lack of of uh, time, uh, they both have advantages because the RNA vaccine is like, like you said, it's the first time. So everybody's the lowest thinking, is it, is there, are there going to be some things we don't know about? The old fashioned ones, you know, it's been tested over and over. So people may feel more comfortable. But from what I read, the RNA vaccine is actually more protective. Mm-hmm. Like I say, very rarely do you have a vaccine that's 90, 95% protective. And these reach that level. Wow, that's awesome. Um, and I also read that health officials in the UK are allowing people to mix vaccine doses, like first shot from Moderna, get the second one from Pfizer. Are there any concerns with that approach? I don't think so, although I probably wouldn't do it uh, if you can't avoid it, right? Okay. Usually in the medical practice, you don't go too far away from standard practice. So when the vaccines were tested, they're tested pretty carefully, you know. So I guess in a bind, you might do that. But I'm not sure the pharmaceutical companies are going to recommend it. Yeah. So ideally, stick with the the same vaccine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because they're tested that way. Yes. Okay. Makes sense. And so this new strain of COVID in the, in the UK, that's 50% more contagious. The vaccine protects against this new strain, correct? Yes, it does. And that's been tested already. Okay. So the protein mutated, but not enough Mm. that the vaccine wouldn't work. Seems like it should work pretty well. Okay. And on a similar note of kind of what you were just saying, I've I've heard that the vi- the virus is basically constantly mutating, but that many of those mutations don't matter. So at what point does it start to matter? We don't know. So <laughs> the ma- we don't know when that's going to happen, right? But we probably do know when that would matter because if the protein mutates to the point that your immune system can't recognize it anymore, then you won't have immunity. Mm -hmm. So the way they're testing it right now is that they take somebody who's been either sick with the first or been immunized already, they can take their blood and show that their blood still recognize this new version of the protein. When that doesn't happen anymore, 
there's going to be some concerns. We're in trouble. So, yeah. But well, then they would design it really quickly. So yeah. the good thing about the mRNA is really quick. So you can just design it very quickly. And then they have to, and they do have a lot of safety data. So I don't know if the FDA will allow them to cut, you know, short a little bit of the safety data. But the idea would be that, you know, you already know this process works. So let's do it again, just with a different RNA slightly. And you can just make that in the in in the laboratory and it's pretty quick. Okay. So it sounds like if the virus were to mutate and um, these pharmaceutical companies needed to produce a new vaccine that would be effective against this mutation, it's not yeah. going to take as long as it just took for us to get this first COVID vaccine. Right. It'll be right. quick. There, there won't be as much skepticism too, because people are saying, oh, I did the first one and it was fine. And, you know, I didn't get that sick and it protected me. Yeah. I hope that's the conclusion. So then you can say, let's do it again. And yeah. the FDA probably will give them a lot of leeway and say, we, you don't have to do it this much you know, because we have a lot of safety data now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's a relief to hear that it's not like starting from scratch and mm -hmm. uh, in it for another year waiting for, for a vaccine if that were to happen. Um, what are the side effects that people are experiencing from the vaccine? Yeah, so it's so the vaccine is a little bit like a mini virus in some ways, <clears throat> and uh, of course you didn't put it into the nose, into the lungs, so you don't get coughs. Mm -hmm. You know, so you don't have the respiratory issue. But um, I think they the most prominent is the pain you get at the site of injection. So a lot of like two thirds of the people I think witness pain, well, experience pain, and then. Um, People will have, you know, people will get really tired. Some people may get really tired. Some people may have fever. And um, I think the percentage is relatively high, maybe 30% or so might get fever or headaches mm -hmm. or, you know, just generally feeling pretty tired. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so you will, I think I would expect some side effects. Uh, the only thing with vaccine everybody has to ask themselves is, is that side effect, you know, should we get a vaccine and go through the side effect? Is it worth it? So the other example I give to people is like, you have a seat belt, you know, it doesn't feel very good when you put it on, but it prevents you from dying, right? So yeah. it seems like not a, a small price to pay to be sick for a day or two. And Absolutely. you don't have to get intubated. Uh, so, yeah, well, the, you know, the pain and soreness at the site of injection, that sounds like any other kind of flu shot. I usually have a sore arm, but it's definitely yeah. good to know that around 30% of people might experience that, you know, fever and, and tiredness, um, just kind of as a, a mental preparation. Um, yeah. Chills. Mm-hmm. You mentioned something during our family Christmas Zoom call that made my ears perk up. <laughs> you said that people with filler are seeing some side effects after getting the vaccine. And I was like, oh, shit, I have filler <laughs> because I did my parentheses lines last year. I was actually really super happy with the results. <laughs> um, but I'm sure a lot of my listeners have filler, too. So what are the side effects that some people with filler are seeing and, and why does this happen? Yeah, so this doesn't just happen with this vaccine. You know, sometimes if you get an infection, you may have swelling and stuff. So nobody really knows. I, I don't really know. So I shouldn't say nobody really knows. Most people really don't have a rational reason for why this would occur. But <clears throat> you would get maybe swelling around the filler, you know, wherever it is. You can get, and that's because you're having a, you know, maybe your body recognizes the filler as foreign. Mm -hmm. And when you put in something else that's foreign, it's going, wow, I just saw this other foreign thing. I should just go after this this uh, filler stuff. You know, so you have an inflammatory response. Mm. Okay. So, you, you know, you just so swelling, some pain. Uh, but if you have it at that place, probably should contact a doctor. And I think all they do is give you some, like something to, tone it down like mm -hmm. cortisol or something. You know, so it's nothing major. Um, but if you have a reaction, do call a provider. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, that's really good to know. Um, it sounds like it's a, a minor p- potential side effect, but just something that if people do have filler, they should be aware of and mm-hmm. um, maybe let the uh, let your provider know if you're seeing any side effects like that. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so early on in the vaccination process, um, some people who had a history of anaphylaxis were mm-hmm. experiencing sh- severe allergic reactions to the vaccine. And it was briefly recommended that um, these people with a history of anaphylaxis shouldn't get vaccinated just yet. Um, And then since then, the advice has changed to recommend that those that have had anaphylaxis only in response to any vaccine should hold off. Is that still the case? So I think, um, you know, the point about people having anaphylaxis against like food allergies or bee stings or, you know, um, grass weeds and all that, it doesn't seem like that's a problem. Mm -hmm. They do recommend if you have the EpiPen to bring it with you to the vaccination site. So I actually am allergic to bee sting. I don't expect that anything will happen, Mm -hmm. but I will bring my EpiPen just in case. And if you do have that, you know, sit around for a little bit. So in case you have a reaction, somebody can come and help you. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, the other point is about if you have aller, allergy against other vaccines, again, I'm not so sure that's going to be a, a reason for not getting this vaccine because some of the reason you're getting, um, for example, in flu flu shots, you know, the flu virus, sometimes they grow in, in eggs, you know, just like chicken eggs. Mm-hmm. It's like you're allergic to chicken eggs you know, you can have a reaction, but that has nothing to do with this flu, uh, this uh, COVID vaccine. So they shouldn't, uh, your reaction against egg shouldn't go and have a reaction against this COVID vaccine because the immune system, what's beautiful about it is also very specific. So if you're allergic to eggs, you're not going to be allergic to apple, let's say. You know, if you're allergic to bee sting, if you have uh, some other insect around, you're not going to be allergic to that. So it's pretty specific. So I think it seems like the recommendation that I saw was if you have a allergic reaction, you should really be careful about the second dose. And you should talk to your provider and maybe you should just skip the second dose. So that is something I've read online. But, you know, again, go to your provider because Mm -hmm. don't just take it into your own hands and say, oh, I have a red spot. I decided it's allergy. Therefore, I'm not going to take a second dose. Don't do that. Just go to your doctor and ask them. Okay. Well, that's good for for people to be aware of if they have a history of that kind of um, anaphylaxis and they can have a discussion with their doctor about it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, How does distribution of the vaccine work? Does the U.S. government purchase the vaccine from these pharmaceutical companies and then the vaccines are given to the states and it's up to each state to determine the actual implementation and administering of the vaccine by tiers and priority? Yeah, that's pretty much it. So I remember back in um, April, you know, there were COVID seminars, like from NIH, NIH, which is where Fauci works, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember him and other people talking about our strategy is just going to spend hundreds of billions of dollars and get all these vaccines before they're even fully tested, which is why it's so unusual. Because usually vaccines take forever because the company's like, I don't want to spend that much money. I just want to spend a little bit to see if it's safe. Then I'll go for the next stage of clinical trials. I'll do something else. And every step, I don't want to just, you know, make all the vaccines for the whole world because what if it doesn't work? But the strategy they came up with was pretty amazing, which is all you're wasting is money at this point. You're not wasting human beings. So they bought, pre-bought from companies, you know, hundreds of millions of doses. And so the government did pay for all of this, you know, up front. So the company, then they, they produced these vaccines. At the time, I'm not, I think they don't even know if it's going to fully be working. And then, of course, when it worked, that was great, right? So now we have these vaccines that are coming out. And then they, once the government, the federal government, 
got the vaccine, then they distribute it to the state. And I, from what I understand right now, there's some problems with right now because some states aren't getting what they're being promised. But let's hope that things will be smoother as we go along. And then the state determines what is the tier. So some states have this kind of tier, other states have other tiers. So in that way, it's not centralized, mm -hmm. but that's the way, you know, the federal government decide they're going to do it for now. You know, we don't know what's going to happen. For example, uh, when Biden takes over, if he views it very differently, mm -hmm. like have a centralized response and then uh, everybody does the same thing, it's really not clear. It's interesting to get that insight mm -hmm. and uh, what was happening kind of behind the scenes in April and um, and what that looked like. So thank you for sharing that. Um, as you know, I've already had COVID, but I definitely still plan on getting the vaccine. I've heard anecdotal stories, though, of individuals who have had it and think that they're now immune. So can you talk about why it's important to get vaccinated even if you have had COVID and recovered from it? Absolutely. So one of the concerns is this is a very bizarre virus. It does lots of things that it shouldn't be doing. <clears throat> and people who had it, um, some people don't produce a very strong immune response. So, you know, if you're one of those unlucky people, you might get a big dose of it because you think you're safe and, you know, really get really, really sick. So definitely, if you have uh, the infection, still go get the vaccine, right? Mm -hmm. Because first of all, it's going to really protect you. And even if you had the infection, this will boost up your immune response even further. So let's hope that they'll last a little bit longer, be a little bit stronger. Um, one of the things about the vaccine is that when they did the testing, the vaccine not only was 95% or 90 to 95% effective, but the few people who came down with the illness who already had the vaccine, they had a much milder form. They didn't need to go to the uh, ICU. So it's for like, I'm sure you've heard when people have the flu vaccine, they said, it's really weird. I got a little sick. I had all the flu symptoms, but I was in bed for a day and I was up, right? It's kind of the same idea. So even you might get even if you might get sick, but the disease is much milder. That's really good to know. So a, a friend of mine told me that her friend, and I realized saying that I'm like, this is how myths get started. But <laughs> a friend of mine told me that her friend happened to be at a Walgreens near closing time. And one of the pharmacists came out and asked her if she wanted to get a COVID vaccine because she had a few left at the end of the day. Have you heard of this happening? Should we all just be loitering around Walgreens and CVSs around closing time and hoping we get lucky? Yeah, she must have been really lucky. I've heard of that. So it's not an isolated incident. So, you know, people are so careful. You've heard about where they, the people who are administering, administering vaccine realize that it's like a little bit more than the dose they say it is. Like if a bottle has four, supposed to be have four doses, and it actually has five, they're squeezing out that last one to give this to somebody else, right? Mm -hmm. So that does happen. I just don't know when you can go catch it unless you go to Walgreens every day yeah. and ask them, do you have any COVID vaccines that you can give me? <laughs> okay. Well, maybe I'll give that a try, but I would assume once you get your first dose that you know, you're automatically registered for the second dose, like three weeks or four weeks depending on which vaccine it is. Okay. Are there any updates on the safety of the vaccine for preg pregnant people? Um, or what about for, for children? Yeah. Um, so the thing is, the vaccine is, both of them are supposed to be people, I think, over 16 or 17. So I haven't really checked into if they're administering to anybody under that age. I would think not. Usually the vaccine guideline, whatever they did their test, you know, all their clinical trials, whatever they did, they have to stick to that. Mm -hmm. And so whatever they did, if, for example, Pfizer may have frozen their samples at minus 100 and they can't change that at all. They just got to stick with this. 
And so unfortunately, the vaccine was not tested in people under 17 or something. So I don't know that they can give it to them until they've tested it. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I would expect that there's some clinical trials going on. Uh, the good news is people under probably 18 don't get it so severely or they don't get any at all. However, mm-hmm. there are very rare cases where some children get really sick, you know, very, very sick. So uh, I hope they come up with ones that can be used for kids. Pregnancies, so far, there's no contraindication. But again, if people are pregnant, they really have to be under the doctor's care. So they should talk to the doctor. But so far, there hasn't been any indication Mm -hmm. that that's going to be a problem. Okay. And so the question that um, I want to know, and that I'm sure a lot of my listeners that are also in my age range, in that 20s to 30s age range, is when can healthy people in their 20s and 30s expect to get vaccinated? And I've heard, I've heard the spring of this year, I've heard summer, I've heard fall. Um, Have you heard any information about that? No, I mean, my prediction would be probably, you know, June, okay. but who knows, yeah. right? Because there's lots of problems that are an- not anticipated. For example, you know, there may be a shortage, you know, they may have manufacturing problems. So that will all hold it back. On the other hand, if both companies are making a lot and the third company comes with the third vaccine, then it's totally different, right? Then it'll go much faster. So right now it's really unclear yeah. uh, what's going to happen. Well, even just seeing people around me in my life that I know that are starting to get vaccinated gives me hope. Like your son-in-law just got (laughs) vaccinated because he's a resident at UCSF. My parents are getting their first dose next weekend. Yeah. Um, So even just, yeah, even just seeing that, I'm like, okay, it's happening and I just need to be patient and and stay safe while I'm being patient. Yes. No, that's a, that's, that's the attitude. I think the more as more people get it and they say, Oh, it's really not a big deal. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe I had a little pain in my arm or maybe I had a little headache. Uh, there's another one that's nausea. So nausea is a side effect too. So if you have that, that's just kind of part of the uh, response. So, you know, when enough people see that and say, it's really not a big deal, uh, then I think we'll, you know, more and more people will get it. Yeah, definitely. I appreciate some of my Um, friends. I have some friends that are nurses and they're bloggers. And so they Mm -hmm. were posting their whole experience of getting their vaccines. And, um, you know, one of them did have a fever, but she was like, it wasn't that big of a deal. It broke after a day. And and another one was like, I just had a sore arm. So it was just nice to see them sharing that because, you know, when you know someone that has had it and can confirm it was not a big deal, it just makes you personally feel a little bit more, um, secure in that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So does it cost money for the individual to get vaccinated? So what the vaccine doesn't. So the the vaccine itself doesn't. But I have read somewhere that you may have to pay for the uh, the administering of the vaccine, Mm -hmm. but it should be covered by your health insurance if you have one or a government sponsor program. And um, hopefully you know, nowadays with Obamacare, probably there are fewer people who are uninsured, but, you know, the vaccine itself should be covered and perhaps the whole thing may be covered. Mm-hmm. So the, the financial part, I'm not crystal clear, like how much we have to pay. I suspect for people who are on insurance, maybe not, nothing. Okay. And you kind of touched on um, this earlier and gave us some insight into the how into how the U.S. government pre-purchased these vaccines. But what does that look like for other countries that maybe aren't as wealthy as the U.S.? How do they get yeah. access to the vaccine? Yeah, it's very very tough. So um, the good news is, you know, the African continent has been very successful, and they actually don't have the same kind of, you know, tragedy that we're having here in the West Western world. And people think it's maybe because they had experience with a lot of other infectious diseases. So they take all these precautions, uh, but for whatever reason, it's not quite as bad and fatality is not as bad. 
in terms of, you know, for example, I'm not saying these are poor countries, but like um, a lot of countries in uh, South America, for example, are starting to test vaccines. And some of them are, for example, from China. And the reason is because those vaccines do not require, they're not RNA vaccines. They're traditional vaccines. So they don't require freezing at minus 80 and minus 100 because they just can't, right? So it's Mm -hmm. normal vaccines may not be as good, but does some of the job. You know, if it's 60% protective, you know, that will reduce quite a bit of uh, fatality. So it's starting to be where uh, obviously the poor countries are going to have a big disadvantage, you know, but I also bring up Africa because you worry about lots of, if if there's lots of infection, how is it going to be controlled? But it turns out, you know, Africa is one continent that we can all look up to. Wow. Um, That's interesting to know. Yeah. mm -hmm. So we've been hearing the term herd immunity, but what does that actually mean and what percentage of the population needs to be vaccinated in order for that to be accomplished? Or is that is herd immunity feasible? Herd immunity is feasible with vaccines. It's also feasible for normal infections, except lots of people die, right? So lots and lots of people die. So that's the price you pay if you want that kind of herd immunity. So obviously there were some, you know, professors going around or MDs going around uh, proposing that we should get herd immunity. The problem is, is it having, you know, millions of people die? Is that acceptable to get herd immunity? So there's different numbers. Uh, I've seen 70% should be immunized for us to have herd immunity. So that whole idea is like, Let's say you have a room full of people, right? You have 10 people and eight people have are vaccinated. So they're not going to, and they're really good about, you know, wearing a mask or something. So they're not going to get the virus. And let's say they didn't wear a mask and the vaccine really prevents them transferring it. They're not going to pass the virus to other people. So that's the case with measles vaccine. Once you have it, you're not going to pass it to other people. And so those, the two people who are left, unless they are both, one of them is vac- is, uh, is infected and they're talking to each other and being really close, that's the only time you get two people who are infected, right? So the chance becomes much more reduced. So if you think about a party, you know, with 10 people and those pe- two people aren't talking to each other, but all these other eight people are talking to each other and talking to the two people, that's not a problem. Mm -hmm. So you can see how herd immunity is being generated. Got it. You explain it so well. Like I can just picture these two people in a room at a party, but they're on opposite sides and they're not mingling and they don't get sick. (laughs) Right. Exactly. Yeah, I teach teach classes that work. Yeah. (laughs) So what would you say to someone who is worried about the speed at which the vaccine was developed and how quickly it was produced and is wondering, is it safe? Yeah, I I think a lot of people had worries in the beginning, but you have to remember, like I was saying, a lot of the basic research was done years ago. They They thought about RNA vaccines. They knew that this protein and other coronaviruses, so coronavirus is a big family and many of them look alike, but they're not exactly the same. So way back, they've targeted this protein, and this protein is one, like during SARS, for example, or MERS, the equivalent of this protein was thought to be the one that's going to generate immunity. So they have a lot of built-in knowledge from previous research, you know, from 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And so they knew a lot, or just in animal studies, so they knew a lot about these viruses. So it's not like you know, 2020 was the first year they looked at this virus. So they have all that basic knowledge called basic science, and now they're just building up on it. So the fact that the other reason it's so fast is because, like I say, the government took away the, usually the inhibition of the company, which is, you know, should I invest this much into it? Because who knows if it's going to be successful. So what the government did is say, don't worry about that. We're going to pay you. We're going to just buy this many, right? 
And so that took away the thing about, should we make it? Should we not make it? So when they're doing clinical trials, you know, lots of other things are going on at the same time. And the third thing is the, of course, everybody wants this vaccine to go quickly. So the FDA, I don't believe they cut any corners because the FDA is really, really strict, but they make things go faster, right? So this becomes top priority Mm -hmm. versus number 28, right? So this becomes top priority. So everything got pushed through much faster. Yeah, that makes sense. Are there any other myths about the vaccine that you have heard that you would like to dispel? Well, I think there's certainly people who would not take any vaccines, right? Right. Um, Because they say, well, it's not worth it because I'll have to stay in bed for two days. You know, I gave that example earlier of the seatbelt, you know, they'll say, well, there are people who will get allergic responses and it's pretty severe. And certainly there are people who have a severe response. There's no question about it. And there may be even one or two cases or maybe more of people who really, really, really get sick or perhaps die, you know? So the question is, you think about this, like you're wearing a seatbelt, you're wearing a car, uh, you're in a car, and 99.9% of the time it protects you. But there's one time maybe the car catches fire, you know, and you have a seatbelt and you can't get out because you can't figure out how to loosen yourself in that split of a second. So you, there is a chance that the car will catch on fire and you can't loosen yourself. So the question about vaccine is always you weigh the good versus the bad, right? So you have to weigh that. And in the case of COVID, I think actually in most infectious diseases, there's just no question that being vaccinated is better than worrying about that very tiny possibility. You know, even the the filler that you were asking me earlier, I think it's like one out of 5,000 or less than that. I can't remember what the number is, but it's very, very rare. You know, so you have to ask yourself, should I risk getting COVID, you know, getting really sick, or should I, um, you know, take this chance? So it is an individual decision, but it's the same idea as, you know, should I wear a seatbelt or should I not just in case the car catches on fire, I can run out faster? You know, it's the same logic. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, I am definitely going to be lining up as soon as my age group is allowed to have access to it. Um, Aunt Jenny, Dr. Ting, thank you so much. This has been Incredible. such a, an enlightening conversation. I learned so much. I know that listeners are going to learn a lot about it. And um, I just really appreciate you taking the time because I know you are very, very busy. So thank Not you so much. It's, it's a lot of fun. And I'm glad you're spreading the news. Yeah. And also information. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you joining me. You're very welcome. Bye. Okay. Bye bye. Wow, just really appreciate my Aunt Jenny, Dr. Ting, taking the time to chat today. As you can imagine, she's a very busy lady, and she's got a jam-packed schedule. She's in super high demand given her amazing background and the research that she does at UNC, so just really appreciate her taking the time to chat with us and so generously share all of her knowledge and expertise in this area. As I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, I learned a lot, and so do yourself and your loved ones, your family and friends a favor and share this episode with them. Grab the link, share it with them, share it on your Insta stories as well. Take a screenshot of the episode and be sure to tag me. I'm at WTFab on Instagram. And if you got any value out of this episode, also do me a favor and rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform of choice you like to listen through. It's the best way to support the What the Fab podcast and help me grow it. And I would just really appreciate that. With that, I will talk to you all next week. 